Thank you. Thank you very much. And I mean, I have to say, I mean, both uh, the, the two lectures you've already heard have been phenomenal, and not just because I love uh, uh, Dave and, and Mark, but they really did a good job setting up, you know, IBD today, how we should be treating, who we should be treating, and, and sort of pushing, pushing the envelope. So we're going to talk now about therapeutic drug monitoring. Should we use it routinely or occasionally in IBD? And I'm going to say routinely. Uh, that could be the end of the lecture, but we'll go into a bit more detail if this works. Okay, there we go. So when and why do therapeutic drug monitoring in IBD? They've already showed you a bit of data, reactive testing of drug concentrations in antibodies. It better directs care, right? It gives more drug to patients who are going to benefit, and you change therapies in patients who aren't going to benefit from more drug, patients with uh, high antibodies to the drug or patients who have enough drug on board and need a different, different mechanism. And it's also been proven cost-effective both in modeling studies and in prospective studies in Europe. I think the more important aspect is, is sort of what Mark and David introduced is proactive therapeutic drug monitoring, not waiting till you're losing response, not waiting till you have low drug concentrations, but dosing to a therapeutic drug concentration ahead of time. We'll go more into this. We'll, I'll show you data, and Mark's already teased you with it, that it improves outcomes and is cost effective. Most of the data is actually during the maintenance phase of the anti-TNFs. Uh, there is a bit of data on induction, and I actually think that's probably where it's most important. Uh, when stopping an immunomodulator in someone with combination therapy, I'll show you a bit of data on that. And then my favorite, and I think Mark's favorite, is optimized monotherapy with a biologic, sort of better optimizing the drugs we have, utilizing drug concentrations. So the bridge panel is a group that I've been involved with now probably over 12 years group of IBD physicians. We all sort of graduated uh, IBD fellowship around the same time. We did, uh, we do a, a number of RAND panels. We all uh, get together, decide on a topic. Uh, and it's, it's not just a consensus panel. It's a very algorithmic uh, routine where um, there's an extensive literature review. You go through the data. You go through different scenarios. You vote on the different scenarios from a one to nine, inappropriate to appropriate. You meet in person uh, and vote again. And in this setting, we found it appropriate to perform therapeutic drug monitoring at the end of induction in patients who are primary non-responders, meaning are they not responding because they're not getting enough drug, in secondary loss of response, which is where I think most people are used to this, during maintenance and responding, which is proactive therapeutic drug concentration monitoring, and restarting after a drug holiday, right? You have someone on infliximab, they go a year or two without drug for whatever reason, you're going to restart it. It's that second infusion, not the first one, it's the second infusion that has the highest likelihood of a severe infusion reaction. So the time to test drug and antibody is actually after the first dose uh, before you give them the second dose. Interestingly, it was found to be uncertain, probably because of lack of data at the time. This was a few years ago now, at the end of induction in responders. But I actually think that's a very important time to, to test. So what's the data for this, right? We're going to be balancing. I'm going to try to balance data and, and common sense. And sometimes it, it's a bit hard to do. So there have been a many, many. This is just a short list of cohort studies, post hoc analysis that show what you think it would, right? It shows that drug on board uh, is associated with better outcomes. You'll see the list here. Mo the majority of the studies are with Crohn's disease and with infliximab uh, because we've been using those the longest. But there is data, as Mark mentioned, for adalimumab, sertolizumab, ustekinumab, and, and vetolizumab, right? And in fact, the, the higher the, the drug concentrations, it actually seems to be associated with better outcomes. So the higher you go, you'll go from response to remission to endoscopic remission, right? And that's sort of what we're hoping for. It's really the low drug concentrations that you can see that's associated with loss of response. And to date, there's really only been one study 
uh, that's ever shown high drug concentrations have a negative impact, and that was a letter in a rheumatology journal suggesting that uh, three trough concentrations greater than 24 were associated with a slightly higher risk of uh, infection. Dave showed you this study, but this is important, right? This, this tells you how your patients are going to clear uh, the, the drugs. Um, and unfortunately, on this list, most of them have a, a pretty negative impact on the pharmacokinetics of these drugs. And the only one here that's actually shown to decrease uh, formation of antibodies and decrease drug clearance is the use of a concomitant immunomodulator. Everything else, the sicker you are, the more you're going to clear the drug, also the bigger you are. So reactive TDM, Dave, Dave touched on this. Again, I'm going to show you that better directs care, as, as Dave showed you, and it's more cost effective than compared to just empirically doubling up on the drug or decreasing the interval. I'm going to cut to the chase. And again, here, I put it in red, and, and you've heard it now from two other people. Anytime you have a patient coming in with symptoms, you need to confirm that those symptoms are related to active inflammatory bowel disease and they're not related to something else, whether it's C. diff, another infection, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Dave had a couple of great slides on it. Then, once you confirm active inflammatory bowel disease, then you can start utilizing drug concentration. So you check, and again, I think the most important really is the drug concentration of the drug antibody is a bit secondary. So if you have therapeutic anti-TNF drug concentrations, that's when you know the patient is no longer responding to that mechanism. You need to switch outside of class. I'm going to say it's, it's I, Dave said I would clear up some of the gray areas, and I, I think we'll try to do so hopefully in the discussion, but there is gray area. And what that therapeutic anti-TNF concentration is, is a big gray area. Um, and, and so what I would say is don't give up on the drug too early. The first drug you use is the best drug, and to me, I optimize that drug because if I give up on that drug in that setting, you lose the entire class. So if you give up on infliximab, you lose the entire class. Um, because you're now postulating that it's mechanistic and not going to respond to an anti-TNF. I'll show you a bit. I put it in the slides, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I had way more slides in my lecture, and I hit a bunch, but they're there for your reference, and, and hopefully they'll be helpful. So if you have a subtherapeutic drug concentration, no antibodies, and this is, sort of, this is sort of easy, you dose escalate. You can either do that by increasing the dose of the drug or decreasing the interval. You talk to any of the pharmacokinetics people, decreasing the interval uh, it actually is associated with higher drug concentrations, and, and it makes more sense. Sometimes you have to balance uh, patient preference as well. Antibody positive, again, some people would tell you, up, oh, they have antibodies, give up, move on. I'd say it's a little bit more subtle. If patients have high antibody concentrations, that's when I'm going to switch to an anti-TNF. And as Dave mentioned, and it's very important, if you form antibodies to one anti-TNF or, or one biologic, you're much more prone to form antibodies to another one. That's a patient who clears drug, uh, and that's someone who you're either going to dose more aggressively with that second biologic, or you're going to include a concomitant immunomodulator. Low-level antibodies, as Dave mentioned, there's a bit of data, not a whole bunch, but there's a bit of data in the literature suggesting that with dose escalation and, in, in some cases, just the administration of an immunomodulator, you can actually overcome these antibodies. And to me, again, I will optimize that first drug before giving up on it because although we have newer drugs, we're still not the rheumatologist where we can just sort of willy-nilly throw stuff around. So I definitely overcome. I will increase dose. I will decrease interval. And depending on the situation, I will add an immunomodulator. This is a study done by uh, Fernando uh, Vallejos. This was a, just a modeling study, which, again, 
showed that reactive testing actually saves money. It's more cost effective than empiric dose escalation. And in fact, as I mentioned, it better directs care. There's lower time these patients are on high dose biologics. They go to surgery when they need it. They switch drug when they need it. This, I think, is the, the more important situation, or one of the more important situations. 18-year-old male, two years of extensive Crohn's colitis and perianal disease, previously failed azathioprine, now doing well on infliximab, five mg per kg, and azathioprine for the last six months. Should you check his infliximab trough concentration and antibodies? Short of Mark, who would do this? So I get a couple of hands, so that's, that's better than it has been in the past. Hopefully, we'll, we'll get a few more going up by the end. So this is proactive therapeutic drug monitoring. I'm going to move a little bit more quickly. It improves clinical scores in CRP from the TAXA trial that Mark showed you. It also decreases the need for rescue therapy with the TAXA trial, prolongs duration of infliximab with less infliximab discontinuation. Uh, and I'll show you our data. Actually, I can show you now. Uh, we'll, I'll show you more data from, from the trial we did with Mark, and it is cost effective. This isn't a new concept, right? I'm, this is something we've been doing for years, right? During my residency, we did this all the time with Gent, Vank, when I was at Mount Sinai, and, and now when we use cyclosporin and IBD. You know, we check drug concentrations. Mark mentioned you don't want your patient who had a liver transplant to have you know, rejection because you're not following his TACRA levels, right? You do it, it's standard of care. So it's just the concept of the therapeutic window and it's, again, it's a pretty simple concept, right? In some drugs, it's really that ceiling that's most important. You go above that ceiling, the drug becomes very toxic. Gent, DIG, sort of very good examples. As I mentioned, we don't seem to have that ceiling, or at least we haven't found that with the biologics. With the biologics and any drug, if you don't have drug on board, it's not going to be effective, right? And it's even more important with the biologics, because if you get these undetectable drug concentrations, that's what's going to associate with the development of antibodies, right? When, when we first started using infliximab, crazily enough, we would give one dose. If they responded, you would just then wait till there was no drug on board and they had a recurrence of symptoms before giving them another dose, right? 60 plus percent of the patients developed antibodies, right? That's the worst thing we can do. You can, there's no worse way of inducing immunogenicity than showing a patient an intermittent antigen, which in this case is the drug you actually want to work. Um, so this was the TAXA trial. As Mark mentioned, this was a, it, it, this was a, a nice flawed, albeit study, prospectively looking at this concept. And again, as Mark mentioned, this is, this is an oft misquoted study, and, and misquoted is negative, but when you talk to the authors, they'll, they'll really tell you that this suggested that proactive therapeutic drug monitoring actually improves outcomes. So as Mark mentioned, these were patients coming through into the clinic in Leuven, Belgium. They would come in. If these patients were in a stable remission or in a stable response, they were all then, they had a drug concentration and they were optimized. The key, as Mark mentioned, every patient was optimized. They would check a drug concentration. If their drug was low, they would give more drug. If their drug concentration was high, they would decrease the amount of drug. Everybody was dose optimized to a trough concentration of three to seven. Then and only then after they were optimized were they re then randomized to standard of care, which is dosing based on symptoms and CRP, or continued proactive TDM and dosing to a therapeutic concentration. Unfortunately, they optimized everybody and only followed them for one year. But again, here's the key, and Mark showed this in a slightly different way. In those patients with Crohn's disease who had subtherapeutic concentrations, they gained 15% of patients who were just responding and now put them into remission. And I don't have the slide here, but they had a drop in CRP as well, so some objective measure as well. You can see on the right, this, it wasn't the case for ulcerative colitis, but 90% of the patients were in remission and 90% had normal CRP. Again, unfortunately, they did not hit their primary endpoint because all patients were optimized, and then and only then were they followed for a year. 
I'd like to say you can sort of see about a year, you're starting to see the curve separate, and I think they would continue to separate if they continue to follow them. There were a number of secondary outcomes that did favor proactive TDM, and that's less patients that were getting their dose monitored and optimized needed less rescue therapy, and less patients had undetectable trough concentrations, which we know are associated with eventual uh, antibodies. I'll skip the rest. And the, importantly, there was a similar cost between the two groups, so it did appear to be cost effective. So this is my original paper um, where basically I would be in the clinic and, you know, I have to say I trained with the dam president, Mount Sinai, who, you know, all his research, the 6MP, all came from the clinic, and it was similar with me. Seeing these drug concentrations, just I didn't know why we weren't doing it. So in practice, I would tell the patients about the therapeutic window concept, and I would start dosing the patients. I, almost akin to the tax that they'd come in, I check a drug concentration and then optimize it. A little bit different if they had an undetectable drug concentration, had no antibodies, I'd increase by about two and a half mg per kg. They had high antibodies, it wasn't working, I'd stop. If they had low drug concentrations, less than five, I would do more subtle increases by 50 or 100. These days, like I said, I've learned over the years now, I, I do more with uh, decreasing the interval. And again, if they were in what I termed the therapeutic window, five to 10, I didn't make any change. And again, I'll be totally honest, five just seemed like a good number. And again, to me, it's that bottom number that's more important. Why well, sort of sit right around undetectable if the patient gets a cold, doesn't show up, you're, you're running the risk of undetectable levels. If they were drug concentrations greater than 10, I would actually, on two occasions, dose de-escalate the drug or increase the interval. This is the, the, the shot that really showed that what we did is, again, this was done in clinical practice, and a, and a few years ago, we took those patients and we compared them to patients from our inflammatory bowel disease center who were getting standard of care, empiric dose escalation, often to 10 mg per kg, or reactive testing. Um, and you can see here drug persistence, and this is in weeks. That green line is actually one year, and that's actually about when the curves start to separate. We had almost 90% persistence on drug compared to about 50%, uh, which is more akin to what we're used to seeing. Um, and as, as Dave showed you, even within the first year, you're gonna lose 50% of your patients. Mark touched on this. This is online, hopefully in press soon. Uh, Mark and I worked together and we, we sort of combined uh, patients from Beth Israel uh, and Penn. And we looked at patients who had therapeutic drug concentration monitoring and then if it was all based on what their first drug concentration was. If it was proactive, they were thrown into the proactive pile. If it was done reactively, uh, they were considered reactive. Um, and then really what we did is look at treatment failure. We looked at serious infusion reactions, IBD-related surgeries, hospitalizations, antibody development. There was markedly less treatment failure in those patients getting proactive TDM compared to reactively. Uh, it didn't matter if the patients had Crohn's or UC. In fact, there was a bigger difference uh, in UC than there was with Crohn's disease. Uh, and as Mark showed you, there was less IBD-related surgery, hospitalizations, antibody formations, and serious infusion reactions when doing this proactively. And again, as it makes sense, those patients in that lowest quartile, they were the ones that had uh, the, the worst outcomes. What were the strengths? It was a large sample size, long follow-up, and really what we did in clinical practice. Limitations, it's retrospective. We used uh, two different assays. It was the uh, overlap between the ELISA and the hemobility uh, shift assay. Uh, we did not have a control group that did not undergo TDM, but I really do think now you have good objective evidence, proactive outperforms reactive, and again, this is in there, but this is what I do in clinical practice where I dose optimize all my patients to a trough concentration of greater than five. I write to 10, because that's often what I do. But again, after doing this for so many years, I do find that we don't know what that exact window is and individual windows are different than population windows. And I have a number of patients 
who I have running between 10 and 15, because if I go below it, they develop symptoms or antibodies. Uh, again, most of the data is that is in the maintenance phase, but I think it's as important, if not more important, in the induction phase. As you've seen now a couple of times, these are the patients that are sick, right? Low albumins, high CRPs, these are the ones that require more drug. Really what we need to be doing is pouring drug into the people, getting them better, and then backing off on the drug. Uh, I didn't show you the study, but there was a, a European study that really shows this se se severe UC really have a lot of infliximab that they're just losing in their stool. This study, they weren't even that sick. They were moderate to severe. They were outpatients, but they showed early drug concentrations at week six are associated with better outcomes, in this case, endoscopic outcomes. And here, of those non-responders, three-quarters of the non-responders already developed antibodies, and these are seen as early as day 18. These antibodies can happen quickly. Um, this was a study done by uh, one, of, one of my fellows when he was in Belgium, really, again, showing the same thing. Week 14, even week 6 and week 2, the higher the drug concentration is associated with better outcomes, in this case, short-term mucosal healing. But more importantly, I think, or as important, is Marla has, Dubinsky has shown that those early drug concentrations at week 14, they correlate with long-term outcomes. If you're, give, you know, if you're giving just enough drug that they respond or they get better, but then their drug concentrations are dropping to become undetectable in the maintenance phase, I think that's why there's such a steep drop in that first year, because that's where you're getting a lot of this antibody development. Mark already touched on optimized monotherapy. This is what I do almost routinely in clinical practice. To me, it doesn't make sense to use two drugs when you can get away with optimizing just one of them. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there, it's safe. I'm not saying I don't use combo therapy, but there is some risk of combo. And let me tell you, it is much easier to get a patient to go on one drug than to have to start talking about adding on a second agent that affects their immune system. So I'm going to skip through a little bit of this uh, and cut to the chase. Mark showed this, uh, the next slide already, in the SONIC trial, right? That's what everybody talks about when they talk about the benefits of combo therapy. The combo therapy did, group did better, but why did they do better? They did better here. They did better because, and you see in blue, most of those patients in the highest quartile of drug concentrations were in the combination therapy group. And look on the left. The, highest con the, the, the group that had the lowest concentrations were mostly in the monotherapy group. And this just shows, this breaks it down by drug concentration. It wasn't, you know, what the addition of the immunomodulator did is increase drug concentration. When they broke it down based on drug concentration, outcomes, that's what mattered. And we had actually published this, you know, we, we, we sort of did this um, in that group of patients I had. 31 of the patients in that proactive group were on monotherapy or on combo therapy and decreased to monotherapy. Most of that, all of them achieved a trough greater than three and most greater than five. And none of these patients in our group stopped drug by the end of almost a three and a half year follow up. So this is the other uh, time I think it's, it's important is, you know, if you do have a patient who you start on combination therapy or they're on an immunomodulator and failing it and they're doing well six months, 12 months later and you want to think about stopping it because really most of the data on combination therapy is in that first year. Um, stopping the immunomodulator, at least in the short term, didn't have, appear to uh, be detrimental, but you know, 25% require stopping the drug and, and about 40% require dose optimization that you do see the group where you stop the immunomodulator, get higher CRP and lower TNF. So I think what's important is checking drug before and then following drug after you stop it. And this is a study that was at DDW a couple years ago. These took patients in combination on infliximab and azathioprine. They were both optimized. And they randomized them to either continuing the azathioprine on the left, having the azathioprine in the middle, we're stopping the azathioprine on the right, and they followed them out a year. And again, as I mentioned, at a year, the outcome of, uh, uh, of failure was about the same, but you can see here the median dose of infliximab was now half. 
And most importantly, now, when they stop the infliximab, the trough, over 40% of patients went up to having an undetectable trough concentration, and you can see the antibodies go up. So if you're gonna stop drug, if you're gonna stop the azathioprine, check your, your, the trough concentration of your biologic ahead of time, and definitely with infliximab, assume it's gonna go down by half, so you may wanna optimize that before you stop it. And when you, if you do stop it, I would recommend continuing to follow the drug concentration because now you have this patient who's sort of naked out there, right? They don't have the addition of an immunomodulator to help with, um, uh, with that. So here are some of the numbers I sort of put up as far as um, where you want people for clinical remission with infliximab, five. I, I think probably adequate. Deeper remission, most of the studies, as I said, if you want endoscopic healing, you probably have to shoot higher. Week 14, Marla's data suggests seven, although I, I'll be honest with you, I think a week 14 level of seven is low. Uh, you would expect much more drug after an induction. Uh, and the adalimumab numbers aren't much different. I typically shoot for a, a trough of greater than about 10. There's issues with it. We don't know the optimal trough concentration windows as much as I just sort of showed them to you there. When we best test, most of the data is in the maintenance. I think the most important data is during uh, the induction. We need a test that's accurate, accessible, and inexpensive, and not sure that we have that. Uh, people are definitely working on point of care testing where you can do almost a finger stick and, and have your drug concentration and make immediate changes. In practice, know your test, know which one you use. Is it a drug tolerant assay? Can it measure antibody in the presence of drug? If there is a cost, what is it to the patient? Know what to do with the results. And there's a, a website, we, we sort of can run through that. If nothing else, I would say test reactively, but I would say if you really want what's best for your patient, I would do it proactively, and I would do it both either during or at the end of induction and during maintenance. These are the assays that are out there. Again, this is more for reference because I'm already over and I see Dave starting to sweat in the front row. Um, this is a good website for you. You can click on the Bridge IBD and hopefully we're gonna be updating it this year. You can plug in the drug, the drug concentration, the antibody and the clinical scenario and it'll sort of tell you what we came up with as far as recommendations, as far as being appropriate, inappropriate. Um, we're in the middle. So the conclusion so far, and again, I still think we're, we're at the beginning of, of TDM, although it's, it's taken us 20 years already. Uh, there's clearly a positive association between trough concentration and clinical outcomes. Drug concentrations and antibody, anti-drug antibodies help guide clinical decisions. Reactively, it's more cost effective and appropriately directs care proactively improves outcomes, cost effective. When compared to reactive testing, it decreases treatment failure, surgery, hospitalization, antibodies, and serious infusion reactions. And I think optimized monotherapy may be an alternative or is an alternative to combination therapy. And if you're gonna stop a common immunomodulator before you do it, check the drug concentration of your antibody, uh, of your anti-TNF or any of the biologics. I treat all the biologics similarly uh, and follow it after. Uh, and again, I think early drug concentrations correlate with longer term outcomes. And I think this really is when we need to be checking drugs, but there are issues and I listed them there. I'll stop there. To